Welcome back. My next guest is Dr. Jimmy Huffman and Dr. Bruce Koffler, who are ophthalmologists with a specialty in cornea transplant and refractory surgery. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Now, I, I started out with nearsighted. Uh, Dr. Koffler, why is it I I important and, and why should we worry about it? Well, Jeff, um, many people don't realize that we're going through a myopic epidemic here in the United States and worldwide. Um, the statistics show that uh, back in the mid 70s, 25% of the population was nearsighted, 25% were farsighted, and the rest had pretty good plano vision. We're now up to approximately 50% in the United States nearsighted individuals. So, why is it important? Well, it's important because we could do something about it. And uh, we, we have set up kind of a myopia institute at uh, Huffman and Huffman, where we practice, and we like to get to children early so that we can stop the progression of this nearsightedness and we have techniques in which to do so. Well tell me, in a kid that's probably pretty tough. Well, not really. Um, you have to kind of set up and understand what causes nearsightedness and at least what we know as of today. And some of which is um, all the near kind of computer devices that we're using and the kids are you know, looking at things way up close. Number two is you can never get away from your genetics. So if your mom and your dad and your grandparents are all nearsighted, you're probably going to end up being significantly nearsighted. Um, we know that the kids aren't getting outside and playing like they used to. And we found out in some really good research that getting out into the sun and playing for about two hours a day is really a good thing. And finally, we have techniques in which we can utilize different kinds of contact lenses and maybe soon glasses to create two different images one on the, directly on the macula on the back of the eye and a second image in the mid-peripheral retina so that the whole back of the eye is in focus. And with these different uh, optical devices, be it a contact lens or multifocal soft lens, um, we can actually encourage the eye not to grow, not to get bigger, not to get more myopic. So how old can a person be and use a contact? Well, we um, specialize in something called orthokeratology which is utilizing a molding lens to create these different curves at nighttime in children. So they go to bed wearing it, it doesn't move. It's a nice big lens, it doesn't move. So they're very comfortable. And when they wake up in the morning, they take this contact lens out of their eye and they see beautifully without any contacts or glasses. The kids love it. And we're able to get them to start using it at the age we need to, which is about age six, seven, or eight. So and that's when the eye starts to grow. So you're taking care of kids in my, myopia and nearsighted, but when they get bigger and they can't see, you may have to deal with them for other reasons. Yeah, we have a, a number of options uh, when the child gets older. Uh, once, once they hit the age 18, uh, they can be a candidate for refractive surgery. Now when you say refractive surgery, the, the common name that I, I recognize and most people recognize, I guess, is LASIK? Yes, I... LASIK's one of the options. Uh, probably the most common option in the United States. I'd say 90% of the refractive procedures are LASIK, uh, but there are alternatives uh, to LASIK if someone's not a candidate. Well, who, who is a candidate? So, uh, well, like we said, you have to be at least 18 years uh, of age. That's what the FDA approved. Um, if you're pregnant or trying to get pregnant, uh, uncontrolled diabetes, they wouldn't, or diabetics would not be um, a candidate or someone with something like a connective tissue disorder or are on certain medications. So what's the procedure? Uh, so the procedure, if we're talking about LASIK, you cut a partial thickness um, corneal flap, usually around 120 micrometers. Uh, lift the flap, you use an, a laser, an eczema laser to do the treatment, and then you replace the flap. And often patients uh, have 20-20 vision at their post-op day one uh, visit. And there's other things you can do other than LASIK? So if you're not a uh, candidate for LASIK, um, one of the original procedures was known as PRK, photorefractive keratectomy. And uh, with this procedure, the top layer of the cornea, which is known as the epithelium, is removed. Uh, and then the eczema laser is used to, uh, to perform the treatment. And a bandage contact lens uh, is placed. And these are all outpatient procedures? They're outpatient procedures. Uh, you, would, you would come into the laser center. Um, we, we would give you a light sedation. You'd have your treatment and uh, go home the same day. Great. Now, Dr. Koffler, uh, I wanted to ask you too, how do you know a kid, you know, sometimes a six-year-old doesn't come in and say, Mom, I can't see. How do you know right. that they, they need to come see you? Well, actually, we can do measurements on a child 
and uh, we're very good at, at doing that either subjectively with a retinoscope or objectively asking them to, you know, which is better uh, with this lens number one or this lens number two. And we're able to paralyze the eye muscles that kind of move the lens so that we get the eye in a very natural, relaxed state and we can get readings off of that child's eye. And so we know exactly how nearsighted or farsighted the child is. So if you're pediatrics, if you're adult, you can fix them with contacts, you can fix them with surgery, you can fix them with gra grasses, you can do everything. Mm -hmm. Great, I appreciate you guys coming in. Thanks for the information.